module we looked at Barnabas and Paul, and that's so important to have somebody to co-labor together. This module we're going to look at the four foundational pieces. We're going to cover two first, and we're going to be clear on what are the pieces that make discipleship training work. Remember this uh, verse in Matthew chapter 9, 37 to 38. Jesus says that the harvest is ready. I always believe that. I believe the harvest is ready. I don't want to walk out there thinking that this city is tough. I believe Jesus said the harvest is ready, but the labors are few. So we look forward to the Lord of the harvest. Therefore, we pray, we ask the Lord of harvest to send out workers. How do we train workers? Helen White says something interesting that uh, we need to be aware of. This is our integrated discipleship model. I'm going to explain this as we go along. And I'm going to go through how do we train a newly baptized member uh, from, uh, and from having a spiritual guardian to care group and discipleship and so on. I'm going to explain this as we go along as we look at those four elements. And these four elements are very, very important. And if you have notes, I would encourage you to write down these four elements. Number one, that it is one-to-one. Discipleship is one-to-one. It's personal. Number two is based on the Word of God. Number three is systematic training. Number four is accountability. You know, Ellen White says in Review and Harrow, uh, 1888, she said that one worker rightly trained, one worker trained, which is like 10 workers. You know, if you train them well, it would be like 10 workers. It is so important to have this in mind because um, too often we say, oh, there's no one in my church. I'm the only one. I come from a small little country church and there's no one to help me. My friends, just look for one worker. Look for one person that the Lord has put in your pathway. Train well. It might take six months, it might take a year, but the work will multiply after that. Too often, we want to make training program in a church like a program. We overlay another training department. Training is not a program. Training has got to be based on intentional discipleship. And that's really what we want to look at today. Four foundational pieces for discipleship. All right? The first one, it needs to be one-to-one. Let's, let's look at that model that we discussed in the last um, module. It's one-to-one. Barnabas took Paul under his wings for a year, and he trained them. And we saw the multiplication effect. And Paul taught the same thing. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, you see Paul doing exactly the same thing again. He said, And the things that you heard of me, commit this to, among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who is able to teach others also. So who is Paul talking to here? He's talking to young Timothy. So Paul tells Timothy, the things that you heard from me, commit this to whom? To faithful men. And then commit it to whom? To others. Can you see it's like a multiplication factor in this verse? From Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, faithful men to others. This is so important. This is the model of discipleship. This is the model of how the work is multiplied in a New Testament church. Too often, we try to multiply the work of God by our own methods. If we go back to the Bible, if we go back to see the multiplication methods, we'll be, we'll be enlightened, we'll be encouraged. You know, when I read this verse, commit this to a faithful man who is able to teach others also, I was encouraged by that because I want to tell you a story of my friend. A friend of mine, his name is Erwin. I remember Erwin. Erwin is a young adult who uh, came to church. Um, he got baptized and then he drifted away. And uh, later on, because of some financial crisis uh, in, his fa- in his business, he was brought back by God. Isn't, that, isn't God good? God even allowed crisis to bring our family, our friends, our loved one back. And Owen came back to the Lord. And I remember when he came back to church for the first time, he and his wife came to church. My wife and I met up with him and, so, and invited them home for dinner. And we began to hear his story out and we realized that he has drifted from the Lord and he needed to be disciple. He needed to, be, to grow in faith again. So we decided to spend time with him and his wife weekly and we decided to study the Word of God together. Now, Erwin, every time after the Bible study, he would have sensed a conviction. And he would say to me, Johnny, would you pray for my two sisters? They are Buddhists. We come from a devout Buddhist family. Would you pray for them? And I said, sure, we will pray for them. Every week we will pray for his sisters. And uh, as the Lord renew his heart, as the Lord builds him up, his conviction is great. 
his desire to witness is great he kept praying and praying and one day he said to me johnny this coming week for our study can you change it because my two sisters are coming to care group i said to the bible study group i said really wow that's great we have prayed for the two sisters and finally they're showing up to the care group uh, to the bible study group and i said okay let's do that and the two sisters appeared and we decided to change the bible study and i want to show to the two sisters who are buddhists and very devout buddhists they're so devout that their parents actually have converted the garage into like a buddhist uh, prayer room and uh, so i want to show them the credibility of the bible so we studied Daniel chapter 2. You know the story of Daniel chapter 2, right? We got the statue of the gold and the silver and the bronze and so on. And we're going to show them that the rock will hit the statue and all these successive kingdoms have been fulfilled and predicted in Scripture. And voila, the Bible indeed is a credible source of truth. And it is proven by the history and, and prophecy. I thought I did a good job teaching the Bible. At the end of the Bible study, I asked them, do you have any question? And the older sister looked at me, stared me in the eyes and said, is this a joke? <laughs> I, got like, I was a bit shocked. I've never had somebody say that to me after giving such a good Bible study, I thought. Daniel chapter 2. She said, is this a joke? I said, um, you know, when somebody asks a question, how should we handle that? We should always ask a question would you please elaborate on your question <laughs> and she said yeah is this a joke if your god if your god knows all this successive kingdom why is there still suffering in this world isn't that a good question does it, is your god playing with us and letting us go through all this uh, suffering from one kingdom to another if your god knows all this why is there suffering you see my friends the buddhist mind is always concerned about suffering isn't it this is the concern of their heart. So I said to her, this is a good question. You see, we must always acknowledge that question. This is such a good question. Guess what next week's Bible study is all about? We're going to study if there's a good God, why is the bad world? We're going to study that topic. Wow, she was excited and she came back to the next Bible study. And to cut the story short, we continued the Bible study and she came week after week. The younger sister wasn't too impressed. She didn't want to continue anymore. She wasn't interested at all. And the older sister continued to study the Bible and praised the Lord. After the studying the Bible for a duration of time, she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. We had an evangelistic meeting uh, from a Bible study to evangelistic meeting. She attended the evangelistic meeting and she was baptized after Bible studies from the evangelistic meeting. This lady is his sister. And his sister was baptized and became a son of David. When she was baptized, oh, her husband, a Catholic husband, was not happy. The Catholic husband said, we used to go shopping together on Sabbath. We used to go uh, movies together on Saturday afternoon. What's going on? You don't even go shopping with us anymore. What, I, I'm not happy that you become, and what kind of food are you cooking in the house? You know, and so I remember she had a, such a tough time, but praise the Lord that, um, the Lord is working in his heart. The Lord is working in his heart. My wife and I heard that uh, he likes camping. So we decided to invite him on a camping trip. I remember going on a camping trip with my friend, with his wife, and uh, he came to the camping trip. And when he came to the camping trip, I remember the first time he came, he just did not like our food at all. He said, I want my own food, you know. He wanted to eat all his uh, unclean food, and, and we were just having our nice vegetarian meal, and he was just not happy about it at all. And uh, the poor wife, she was so kind, she cooked two meals and two different dishes and all that. But we began to talk over the campfire, we became a friend, we began to trust each other and begin to know each other as friends. More camping trips ensued, and, and as time go past, to cut the story short, he started to come to Bible studies and came to an evangelistic meeting and he was baptized. Praise the Lord for that. Because he was baptized, his best man at his wedding, who also was a Catholic, came to the next evangelistic meeting and he was baptized as well. But because he got baptized, his wife, who is a Buddhist, heard about him, became a Seventh-day Adventist, studied the Word of God, and she was baptized as well. Because he was baptized, his cousin came to church, the cousin was baptized as well. Now remember, in this story, how many sisters did Erwin have? 
two sisters. And there was one more sister. Just, just wasn't interested at that time. But I tell you, my friends, the Holy Spirit does not give up. God's arm is not too short to reach His people. He's got, God has this wonderful love that He's drawing people. Well, the younger sister, she came to a crossroad in her life. She failed her course at university. Oh, she was so sad when she failed her course. But actually, we've been praying for her every week, and so we were actually very happy. <laughs> Even though she was sad, we were happy because we know that when, when life changes occur, the Holy Spirit is moving. When there's a medical illness, when there is a career change, when there's a relationship breakup, when there's a family crisis, don't think that the Spirit of God is not moving. The Spirit of God is reaching out, constantly reaching out to people. And so we prayed for her and we invited her to the next camp. We have a camp that runs every Easter and she came to the camp. And at this camp, she began to hear the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ again. And to cut the story short, she was the hardest to be won to the kingdom because she felt that if I go with you guys, I'm the only Buddhist left, who is going to go with the parents to go to the Buddhist prayers? And she says, but the Lord worked in her heart and she was baptized. And today she's one of our church leaders as well. And this girl became a missionary as well. And she studied the Bible with another girl and another girl was baptized again. I could add more pictures to this, but my, my slide is full now. Each one has multiplied. This is New Testament model of soul winning. This is discipleship. This is what it means by multiplying God's work. And I believe that God has this model for us today. So discipleship needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. In the, the concept of the things you heard of me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful man. This concept is real. It can be multiplied from one to another to another. But it starts with you. You, as God has called, you, God, has placed the burden on your heart. Pray that the Lord will give you one person that you can study with and baptize and, 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 and disciple and multiply the work of God. A person that you can invest your life in. In our ministry, how do we go about doing this? One of the very important practical implementation is to have what we call a spiritual guardian. When a person is newly baptized, we would have a spiritual guardian. A person that will guide them to help them to grow in faith. And this person, will, 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 they will counsel with, they will help continue to have Bible study with, they will be involved in service together. And that's important as they have accountability through care group as well. We have a little uh, certificate that we use to encourage the spiritual guardians to, to, to serve in this role. And really their primary role is to look after the welfare of the spiritual child. When somebody is newly baptized, when a baby is born into this world, like it's like a baby that's born into this world. When a baby is born, you don't just leave it out on the streets. The baby goes to a home. There's a mother that cares for it. The same in a spiritual baby. There needs to be a spiritual guardian to care for that. Any potential new role that is assigned to the newly baptized has to be checked with the spiritual guardian. Too often, we want to give all the, um, the, uh, the things to, to the newly baptized because they're on fire. They all want to serve. And so we get them to do this and to do that and to do this and to do that. We involve them. We give them all kinds of roles. If we do that, we could potentially be burning them out. In 12, in 12 months, would they be growing spiritually or are they being used in the church? We need to be very careful. The role of the spiritual guardian is to check whether these new roles that is assigned to the newly baptized, is that going to help that person spiritually? The first question the spiritual guardian ought to ask is that if you want to give a role to this friend of mine, will that role help that person grow spiritually? That should be the first question in their mind rather than just involving people. Teach them to write a testimony because the newly baptized have friends that they, are, they want to witness to. Bring them out to give Bible study and serve together like Paul and Barnabas did. Discipleship is not about policing somebody young in faith. Discipleship is about working hand in hand. And it's about, not about do's and don'ts, but it's about rubbing lives together. That's why you see in the New Testament church, there were two years in the school of Tyrannus, daily reasoning together. You see this model as well. 
there's so many things that we could share about how, what, what God is doing. I can, I can share about how God has uh, discipled people in, in cities like Hong Kong and has grown from one uh, small group, team of people and multiplied. We're going to go through that in our next session. It's so important that we understand that discipleship is not about um, uh, checking on people, policing them. Are you good enough? It's, that's not discipleship. Discipleship must be encouraging to build each other up, to develop each other, and to grow in faith. I remember a story of a uh, young man, Tommy, that I shared with you. He went to Hong Kong and he started the first year just getting involved in programs after programs after program after program. After one year, he was so worn out and so tired running programs. He realized that this was not getting anywhere. So he began to start a discipleship program. Not a program that to, to just run in church, but an dis intentional discipleship approach. Finding one other person and finding two other person and then grow the work from there. Today, we are so blessed that to see that there are two care groups there in Hong Kong. They have seen four or five baptisms during this time. And through systematic to discipleship, to systematic um, care group development and training. And we've seen the work of God multiply. And we've seen what God is going to do. And there's many, many stories like this. And um, the second element, the second foundation piece for discipleship training is the concept of the Word of God. The Word of God needs to be paramount in discipleship training. Too often, we have seen discipleship uh, merely just spending time with each other. It's just like involving each other and just serving together. But there's no time between two persons to read the Word. I don't think that's discipleship. Because you can give your godly counsel, you can give your godly advice, but it's nothing like them reading from the Word of God and letting the Word of God change them. So the Word of God is an important element. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. All right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. If you have your Bibles with me, with you, I encourage you to have a look at that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's a great book. It's a book on discipleship. And you notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says that, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, in as much assurance as you know what kind of man we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us in the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, having joy for the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia, Achaia, and all who believe. And from, for from you, the word of the Lord has sound forth, not only in Macedonia, Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. A powerful passage on discipleship. You see four levels again, very similar to 2 Timothy. You see four levels here. Let me show you. From Paul and Silas to Timothy to the Thessalonians. And then from Thessalonians to the believers in Macedonia and Caia. And then to every place, the Word of God sound forth. In this passage, you see the Word of God is central. They, the believers receive the Word. Verse 6. Verse 7, they become examples. They live out the Word. Verse 8, the Word of God sound forth. Powerful. The Spirit of God is there. The Holy Spirit is very important. But you also have the Word of God going hand to hand. So we need the Word of God when we do discipleship. We can't do discipleship merely just by um, serving together. I think there's some elements of doing that by serving together, but it's not as effective. Serving is just roles. Discipleship is life transforming. It's character development. That's what discipleship is. So, yeah, why the Word of God? Because the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is, has created power. God spoke and everything came into being. In Psalms chapter 33, verse 6 to 9. Isaiah 55, 1 said, The Word of God shall not return void. There is a fulfilling power in the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says that there's discerning power in the Word of God. And Psalms uh, 119 verse uh, 116 says there's upholding power in the Word of God. The Word of God is central in everything. If we don't have the Word of God, we really can't disciple people. And 
A powerful verse is John chapter 1, verse 14. John 1, 14. The Bible says the word, which is Jesus, became flesh and dwell among men. The word dwell among men. The word of God dwell among men. And so we, this is very central in how we disciple people. Why is that the case? Because we want the word of God to dwell among men, to be incarnated. The word uh, infleshing or incarnate to dwell in our hearts. How can the Word of God dwell in our hearts? Only when we consume, we, when we have the Word in our mind. And this is so important. Too often, discipleship is, not, is, is done without this and, and becomes a problem. Some people ask me, in Gateway, what was something that you've done that make a big difference? Not me, but the leaders got together and they prayed. We were growing as a church. We were having people baptized. But we realized that we needed to disciple them. But what was one thing that we did in discipleship that makes a big difference? And I want to share with you. One thing that makes a big difference is to teach our members to memorize and meditate Scripture. This is so important. It, we were facing challenges year after year dealing with young people in our church. They will come to old elders for counsel. Oh, you know, you know the favorite question. If you were in my shoes, you know, would you, how, what would you do? You know, you will get this question all the time. Instead of just coming for godly counsel, we need to teach them to go to the Word of God. And so we begin to teach them the importance of the Word of God. Too often, I, I remember one mistake I did. When we had the, uh, a youth leader in the early years of our ministry, we, I would spend time with the youth leader. We would spend a lot of time. We would spend a lot of time just hanging out, talking to one another, talking, playing sports together, getting to know each other. And he would be the AY leader and organizing thing. But I realized that there's some things in his life that God needs to change. And I would try to give him my godly counsel, you know. You need to change this. You shouldn't be doing this. And he would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. I shouldn't be doing that. And one of the issues he had was boundaries with the opposite sex, you know. He's a, a male leader and, and you know, he, we are dealing with young people. So boundaries are very important between male and female. And we would counsel him and say, look, you know, it's not a great idea to, to do a visitation uh, to, uh, at, at, uh, to a girl by yourself. You know, it, you may, people may get the wrong impression. So we just counsel him like that. And then... He'll say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. But then a few weeks later, you hear the problem. He goes visiting again. And uh, you call him up and say, hey, let's meet up and have a chat. And he says, well, you know, somebody is in distress and they are concerned. I'm the youth leader. Shouldn't Christians should be caring? You know, and I went to visit her, her apartment by herself. You know, I go like, but not at 11 o'clock at night by yourself, you know. And you begin to deal with these issues and we talk for hours and go nowhere. I find that if we're discipling just merely by so-called godly counsel and experience, it doesn't go anywhere. I begin to open the Bible. I begin to teach him what is God teaching us. What are the important things about managing uh, and to be, that there will be no appearance of evil. I begin to teach him from the word. When he sees it from the word, he begins to realize that he needs to make changes in his life. There's power in the word of God. There's little power in our words, in godly, so-called godly counsel. So, in the foundation for discipleship, it needs to be one-on-one, -on -one, and we need to have the word of God. And these are very important components. And I, and I pray that you will consider this seriously. As you plan for discipleship, Make sure those elements are in there. And we're going to learn more as we continue in the next module.